everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be focusing on alcohol and the behavioral and pharmacological effects of drinking. Alcohol is probably the most commonly accessible type of drug that we have and use. The ease and access that allows us to be able to try a lot of different types of alcohol in different settings. Craft beer has become a huge craze along with the microbreweries and craft liquors that are available. More and more individuals are getting involved in the age-old market and are putting a new spin on things. Even though this is a legal market, we will learn about the historical and social constructs associated with alcohol use and how this arena will continue to progress in the years to come. Let's go ahead and get started. Alcohol is not a controlled substance, so it, does not, so it is not considered a scheduled drug. However, it is widely dangerous when, when used irresponsibly. While I don't want to turn this into a lecture specifically focused on drinking responsibility, there has to be a certain level of that included here, simply because of the nature of what alcohol can do to your system. Alcohol is a CNS suppressant, so what sorts of behavioral effects will the drugs have? Obviously, we're going to experience things like slowed speech, uh, or, I'm sorry, slurred speech, slowed brain activity and responses, trouble walking, headache, dizziness, vomiting, nausea, etc., especially during the hangover. If you've ever had a little too much to drink, you're probably way too familiar with these symptoms. We drink a ton of alcohol, but not just all here, but all over the world. Other cultures drink alcohol with nearly every meal. It's almost as normal as eating. It's illicit recreational drug. We do not need to drink for any sort of medical purpose, but we sure do like to self-medicate. Drinking is considered a social activity. When in doubt, let's go get a beer. How many different social situations do we find ourselves in which alcohol is present? This slide shows data from the Washington Post that examines how much we drink based on deciles. As you can see, 30% of Americans don't drink at all. They're found at the bottom of this infographic. The top 10% of drinkers drink about 10 drinks per day. If we were in the ninth decile, that equates to about 15.28 drinks a week, basically two drinks a day. You would consume about 800 drinks every year. That's a lot of drinking, and it certainly adds up. The top 10% of American drinkers, meaning 24 million adults over the age of 18, consume, on average, roughly 74 alcoholic drinks a week. So how much is 74 drinks? 74 drinks equate to two one and a half liter bottles of hard alcohol, as is shown on the screen. It also equates to 18 bottles of wine and three 24 can cases of beer in one week. That's 3,800 drinks a year. You're a busy drinker. When we talk about these issues, you notice we always talk about drugs and alcohol rather than just drugs. And why is it that we don't lump them together? It's because we normally do not see alcohol as a drug most of the time. Alcohol is legal. Drugs have stigma that is associated with them. And when we think of drugs, we often think about hardcore things. Drug dealers, overdoses, the potential to ruin your life. You can't ruin your life with something that's in the aisle next to the ice cream at Walmart, can you? And if it were that harmful, then why don't we make it illegal? Advertising and media promote drinking as normal. The picture on the right is a picture of a healthy adult male who is active, in great shape, and he still drinks beer. You could do that too and have this healthy, active lifestyle. You no normally don't see many advertisements with your drunk relatives stumbling all over the place at Christmas. There is also a large distribution and sale of alcohol that occurs every year. Budweiser alone makes $12 billion, with a B every year. We also have a long history of alcohol use. We're so used to drinking that it almost becomes second nature anymore, not just in the U.S., but everywhere. So clearly alcohol has the potential to be a dangerous drug. Not everyone knows how to use it in moderation, and it doesn't take much to get over the limit. If we're over the limit, we often make dumb decisions, and people can get behind the wheel. They drive too fast, they swerve, they drive erratically, and they get into accidents. 50% um, of all uh, Americans will be involved in some sort of alcohol-related traffic accident and sometime during the lives. Either they were the direct cause of the alcohol or of the accident as the drunk driver themselves, or they were hit by a drunk driver. Two percent of all nighttime drivers have blood alcohol um, that levels that exceed legal amounts of 0.08 percent. 
2% doesn't sound at all, all that high, but think about the millions of people who drive a year. Think about how many people that is in a city like Los Angeles or Miami or Dallas or somewhere with a ton of drivers. Now, 2% of all of those drivers are over the limit. That's a bigger problem than you're thinking it might be in that light. So there are four different types of alcohol and only one of which you are able to consume. The first um, of the four that we talk about is methyl alcohol, and this is a poisonous variety. Methanol, as it's more commonly known, is a highly poisonous um, substance, and just a small amount will cause you to go blind. 80 to 150 milliliters will kill you. 150 milliliters, to put that in better perspective for you all, is it equates to 5.07 ounces, which is roughly 3.3 shots of alcohol. Methanol is called wood alcohol because it is a byproduct of the destructive distillation of wood. Methanol is the closest to ethanol in terms of smell and look, but when you drink methanol, your body metabolizes it into formaldehyde, which is toxic to the central nervous system. The second type is isopropyl alcohol, which is also poisonous. We more commonly know know this as rubbing alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol has a very strong odor and is used in a lot of household cleaners. Otherwise, it is used in a lot of solvents for industrial coating and is, and is also used as a gasoline additive. Isopropyl alcohol can be oxidized and turned into acetone. Our third category is ethylene glycol, which is also very poisonous. This one is used as an additive for antifreeze. One of the main ingredients in the creation of Poly, um, polyester fabric as well, and this is the only alcohol that has no odor at all, and when you do consume it, it is reportedly tasting a little sweet. Finally, we have ethanol, also known as drinking alcohol. Ethanol is also used as a gasoline additive, and it can be used in rocket fuel as well. It is also used in hand sanitizer. This kid on your screen is drinking hand sanitizer. He's just drinking a little one, but, um, Teenagers are doing this now because they have found out that there is ethanol in the hand sanitizer. But you can't just drink it. You actually need to separate out the alcohol first, and a lot of teenagers aren't realizing that they have to do this. So how do you actually separate the alcohol out from the hand sanitizer? The answer is table salt. In order to do this, many um, hand sanitizers are in, um, have a blend of ethyl alcohol, water, and moisturizer. Using ordinary table salt, you can easily separate the hand sanitizer gel from the alcohol and the gel's other components. Salt basically binds to the glycerin in the gel, and it forms forming the gel and leaving the alcohol behind as a clear liquid. Aside from scientific interest, this technique could also be used in a pinch to obtain ethyl alcohol uh, for use in a camp stove, for instance. It's a pretty easy thing to do, um, but you are going to need salt and a cheesecloth in order to separate the two out. So basically what you do is you combine the hand sanitizer with salt. Then you cover a bowl with the, with the cheesecloth or something else that's rather porous and then you strain the mixture through the cheesecloth and the ethyl alcohol will pass through and it will leave the gel behind and then you can consume it. Um, however, when you do this process, um, you basically create an alcohol that is somewhere between 60 to 70 percent alcohol um, or 120 to 140 proof. Basically what you're doing is creating moonshine or Everclear. Everclear is about 151 to 190 proof. So you're creating some pretty strong stuff here. So while it's easy to do, I would not necessarily recommend it. Okay, so we drink alcohol and once we swallow it, it obviously goes down into our stomach and into our digestive systems. Once we have ingested it, then the alcohol starts to make its way through the lining of our stomach and into in our intestines and it makes its way into our bloodstreams. Pretty much any piece of tissue that alcohol touches, it will start to pass through. Then once it's in our bloodstream, alcohol affects nearly every single part of us. What happens to our bodies once the alcohol starts to kick in? Our liver starts to metabolize it. Our brain function starts to decrease a little bit, and our heartbeat starts to slow just a little tiny bit. We talk about drinking alcohol, but we can also vape it. Put, um, put the alcohol in the glass, light a little candle, and heat the alcohol, and then you can vaporize it and basically breathe it in. You feel the effects of the alcohol a lot faster than you would if you drank it. 
There's actually a vaping machine that costs about $700 to do this, or you could do it at home with this little setup that I have in the picture for next to nothing. In addition to drinking and vaping your alcohol, there's a variety of other ways in which you can consume it. None of which I recommend, but I just want to let you guys know that it does exist. So in the next picture, you see this young man who is actually snorting alcohol. You can snort it if you want to be really stupid and dumb. Um, this is a rather new trend, but basically when you snort alcohol, if you can actually do this without spitting it all out, um, when you snort the alcohol, it will just go through your nose and down into your stomach the same way you would if you would drink it. So I don't quite know why you would do this, um, but it is possible if you want to try it, I guess. The next big one um, is called an alcohol enema. So there's one of two ways that you can do this. So um, in the picture on your screen, you have uh, two tampons basically sitting in a brown liquor. First of all, if you're going to do this, don't use brown alcohol. Use vodka, gin, something that is a clear alcohol. The brown alcohol will cause more problems than you are anticipating. And while this is not a discussion of all of that, just don't use brown alcohol. When you use a tampon, it's actually called slimming. And basically what you're doing is you're soaking the tampon in your alcohol of your choice. Again, clear, clear alcohols are better, and then you stick it in your anus. The alcohol then seeps, seeps through your rectum and it basically intoxicates you. The other way that you can do this is through a process called butt chugging. And this has become rather quite popular on college campuses. Um, and you may have actually seen this process in a movie called Cockblockers in which you take a funnel, just like you would chug a regular beer with your mouth, but the, the funnel goes somewhere else into your rectum and then somebody pours in the alcohol and it gets absorbed that way. Um, the goal is to get you drunk faster, but there are a variety of consequences that occur when you start putting that much alcohol into your rectum. So again, I don't necessarily encourage it or think that it's a good idea, but for educational purposes, you guys need to know that these things are happening. Okay, so next, dependent on which way you actually consume the alcohol, the assumption, the assumption it is now in your, in your body, and it is starting to cause an effect inside your system. And once it gets to your bloodstream, then you need to start worrying about something called your BAC, or your blood alcohol content or concentration. And this is basically the amount of alcohol that is active in your bloodstream at any given time. So your BAC may be dependent on a few different things. First, have you eaten at all today? So is there any presence of food in your stomach? If you do have food in your stomach that has not been digested yet, it will lower the BAC um, that you experience. So did you eat before you started drinking? Did you eat at all while you were drinking? Um, did you try and sop up the alcohol at Taco Bell at one in the morning? Any of these things will have an impact on the BAC that's in your system. So what are some of the best foods to have in your system to delay the metabolism of alcohol? Fatty foods, any kind of protein, and milk. The more food that is in your system, the lower your BAC will be. So then the second factor depends on the rate of alcohol consumption. So our livers can process one drink per hour. So are you sticking to the recommended one drink per hour, or are you taking shot after shot after shot? Are you binge drinking quite quickly? If you're doing any of the last two compared to the first one, then obviously you're going to get drunker faster and your body will not be able to keep up, resulting in a state of drunken intoxication. What is the concentration of alcohol you're drinking? What type of alcohol are you drinking? So if you're drinking Bud Light, which has a much lower alcohol content compared to something like vodka or compared to something like Everclear, you have some that have higher proofs than others. And depending on how much you're drinking of that substance, it's obviously going to get you drunk faster than something that has a lower alcohol concentration in it. Then finally, your drinkers, the drinker's body composition. So are you male or female? Males um, obviously can tolerate more alcohol than females because females are generally, generally have higher levels of fat on their bodies. Um, not necessarily saying that women are just heavier, but if you think about the amount of breast tissue that we have, that's all fat. So um, female just have, females generally just have larger concentrations of fat on their bodies, so they'll get drunk faster because the alcohol will go straight to the fat. 
are you heavier? Are you a thinner person? As we just talked about, your weight has an impact on it. What is your height? Taller people um, can tolerate alcohol a little better than shorter people. There's more person there to absorb the alcohol. And then your tolerance. So have you been drinking for long? If you are a lifetime drinker, you're going to be able to drink a little bit more than somebody who is on their 21st birthday and is new to drinking. But essentially, no matter who you are or what you're doing, alcoholic beverages are basically just empty calories. Um, there's no vitamins, no minerals, no protein. It's just fat, right? Um, it's a large amount of car carbohydrate, carbohydrates. It's a lot of associated calories, and there's no nutritional value to alcohol at all. Um, but depending on what you're drinking, it may feel like it is a meal at times. Um, I'm referring to Guinness in particular. It feels like you're drinking a loaf of bread, but not all drinks are like that. So... Here we go, we have um, a light beer, genuine, uh, Miller Genuine Draft Light. So beer drinkers are often concerned about the beer that they drink and the carbs and calories that are found in beers. So beer companies have come out with low calorie, low carb beers. Personally, I don't know how good a 64 calorie watered down beer would taste, but if you're interested, it is out there. Most light beers are around the 100 calorie mark. Bud Light is 110, Coors Light is 102, and Miller Light, as advertised, is 96 calories. But um, if you want the really low-calorie beers, like the one you saw on the previous screen, they're all going to be light and watered down ones. Um, Bud Light is obviously going to be a little more watered down and lighter calorie than Budweiser. Um, so it just sort of depends on what you're looking for. But generally, the rule of thumb is that the darker the beer you go, the higher the calorie content. So if you look on this screen, I have a couple different um, beers here in their equivalency in terms of calorie count. So if you drank a 12 ounce Sierra Nevada, basically you're drinking a 330 calorie, 20 ounce Starbucks coffee drink. If you're drinking a can of New Belgium Fat Tire, it equates to two Oreo cookies. And then the harder or the higher you go in terms of calorie content, you're, you're making your way to quartz and stouts and darker coffees. Um, when you get to something like the stout you see on your screen, you're basically eating a large McDonald's French fry. So if you want less calories, go lighter. If you want more calories, go to the darker beers. But the other thing is, when you go to the darker beers, normally those beers have a higher alcohol content, so you don't have to drink as many as you do the Bud Lights, Coors Lights, Miller Lights um, of the world. So you drink one or two beers, you basically have the same amount of con alcohol content as drinking two Miller Lights. So it kind of balances itself out. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the physical effects of alcohol. So obviously, you know, in terms of physical effects, um, that you can become tolerant to it, but there's a larger issue that needs to address cross-tolerance and cross-dependence. So what exactly is cross-tolerance? Tolerance of one drug leads to tolerance of another drug. So if I'm drinking a, drinking a lot of alcohol, um, it might help me become more tolerant to other depressive types of drugs. There's also cross-dependence. Basically, dependence on one drug might lead to dependence on another drug. Alcohol also leads to behavioral tolerance, so overcompensation due to inebriation. So what are some of the types of things that you might do when you're intoxicated? You might try and walk slow and straight. You speak slower, louder. You pronounce your words more clearly. You, if you're driving, you're driving the exact same speed limit. Basically, anything that makes you appear less drunk than you really are. But the problem is, is that sometimes you overcompensate. So our livers um, are responsible for metabolizing alcohol much like everything else. So no matter what we drink, our livers are going to continue to metabolize alcohol at the same rate. If we have one drink or four drinks, our livers will continue to keep working at the same speed. That's why it takes us so long to get the alcohol out of our systems. So the rule of thumb, as I said before, is basically one drink an hour. But who drinks one drink an hour? That's a lot of time to drink one drink and then go drink this before you have your next one. Often in social situations like parties, football games, you're at a bar, you're at happy hour, whatever, we tend to go a little faster than one drink per hour. And if we drink too much too quickly, then that could potentially result in 
intoxication and a later hangover. Um, so we're not waiting the one hour. We're not drinking one drink per hour, and the next day we're feeling really bad. Drug users often drink when they're using other drugs. Um, most people do that in order to enhance the effects, but drinking also provides a stop gap if you would like to fill in the amount of time that it, it occurs between illegal drug doses. If I'm drinking and I want to enhance my drug use, I'm also going to use a CNS depressant, as you know. So what do we call the effect when two drugs work together rather than working against one another? What sorts of drugs would I take in order to get an enhanced or synergistic effect? So if I'm drinking, I might want to take a Valium or a Xanax. Marijuana is the most widely used in combinations with alcohol, but I could also turn to the opiates. Heroin, morphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, for example. Because as you're drinking and enhancing the effects of the drug, it doesn't take as much of the illicit substance to get high. It allows... This basically allows you to save money, and it also allows you to keep your stash a little longer, but it's dangerous. It's more dangerous than just using one or the other by itself. In the short term, um, sometimes drug, or I'm sorry, sometimes people who are drinking will experience disinhibition, which means a willingness to do more things. I'm not necessarily worried about the consequences. I might start acting recklessly. I become overly talkative, more willing to be social, um, things like that. My social setting and my mental state might also determine my individual response. So I might be feeling euphoric, happy, and talkative. Um, I'm friendly. I'm, I'm talking to everybody in the bar. I'm a happy drunk. I want to be everyone's best friend. I'm talking to people I don't know. I might be singing. I might be dancing. I'm having a great time until someone says something disrespectful to me or maybe my boyfriend or girlfriend, and then I turn aggressive and hostile. I'm willing to get in a bar fight, and most bar fights are, are really the result of alcohol-driven anger. An insult gets said here or there, and the next thing you know, they're trying to hit everybody else. Um, I might, alcohol might also interfere with my motor activity, my reflexes, and my coordination. So not being able to walk straight, drive straight, my reaction time is hampered, um, and, and of course, remember that this is a depressant drug, so sometimes everything is slowed down in terms of how quickly I react to things. When I'm using alcohol in moderate quantities, what you end up seeing is a slightly increased heart rate. Remember that anytime you take a depressive type of drug, it puts a strain on your CNS system and your heart has to sort of work faster to compensate for the depressive effects of the drug. You might also see a slight dilation in blood vessels in the arms, legs, and skin. This is why you feel warm when you drink alcohol. It thins your blood out a little bit. And in the wintertime, if you're outside long enough, people always say, well, have, have a little shot of alcohol or whatever, uh, because it creates almost a false sense of work, warmth. But this is one of the worst things that you can do, especially if you're stuck outside in the cold for a long period of time. Alcohol will also moderately lower your blood pressure, it stimulates your appetite, it increases the production of gastric secretions. Gastric acid is a vital part of our digestion. The enzymes that are released are meant to help break down whatever is in your stomach, and it helps with the metabolism of the alcohol that is there. It also increases urine output. Um, the more you drink, the more you need to pee, especially after you go pee for the very first time as you've been drinking. As you break the seal, um, the more you have to pee. So alcohol is a diuretic. Beer has a lot of water in it. And the more beer you drink, the more you need to expel that water. But while you do so, you're actually helping to dehydrate your tissues even more because you're releasing that water. At higher doses, social setting will have little influence on the effects. So it doesn't matter where you're drinking, you're going to feel everything the same way. You'll experience difficulty in walking, talking, and thinking. It induces drowsiness and causes sleep. It also induces a hangover when the drinking stops. The hangover is caused by tissue dehydration. It will also in, um, include a headache, an upset stomach, possible sensitivity to light and sound, and a massive need to consume greasy food and Gatorade. There is a difference between drinking a lot of alcohol over a prolonged period of time compared to drinking a lot of alcohol in a short amount of time. Normally when you drink a lot in a short amount of time, you end up getting sick or you might get alcohol poisoning. 
your body starts to shut down pretty quickly, leading towards death or coma. Sometimes you'll try throwing up to get the toxins out, but not always. Sometimes the alcohol stays in your system and keeps absorbing. So when we talk about driving over the limit, um, in terms of drunk driving, we say the legal limit is 0.08. Um, for, the, for the majority of states, some states might be a little bit lower. So driving over the limit is 0.8% um, BAC. When we're talking about lethal levels of alcohol, we're talking about something that is between 0.4 and 0.6. So not 0.4, 0 0.4 and 0.6. That is six to eight times more than the legal limit we're allowed to um, have in our systems for driving. In terms of dependence, there's roughly 12.5 million admitted alcoholics that we know of in the United States. We also know that men are more likely to become alcoholics than women, but women are very quickly increasing their numbers. We know that relapse will happen. Nearly every single person with dependence issues on either drugs or alcohol faces the potential for relapse at some point during um, the withdrawal process and during the recovery process. If you go somewhere for treatment or attend meetings, these individuals are prepared for relapse and it's not uncommon for this to occur. They will tell you that it is not uncommon for this to occur. And when relapse does happen, sometimes individuals who, who are seeking treatment for alcohol and drug abuse will give up the ship. I can't succeed, I didn't do well this first go around, so I'm going to start using in the long term. Um, however, if you can hang in there and realize that relapse is almost a guarantee for a lot of people, it helps with the recovery process. Okay, you stumble, you made a mistake, let's try again and start over and maybe this time it'll happen for you. If you are trying to withdraw from alcohol, there are a few different ways in which this can help you. Alcohol withdrawal has the potential to be fatal. Um, and for those individuals who keep relapsing and don't necessarily want to start using it again, um, there are, like I said, a couple different drugs that are out there that will help with alcohol dependence. Antabuse is probably the most popular and most prescribed medication that helps with dependence issues regarding alcohol. Um, so you, antabuse basically makes drinking alcohol unpleasant um, because it alters the way your body metabolizes the alcohol. So if you take an antabuse and then you have a drink, what is going to happen? You're going to start getting flushed. You will start feeling warm. You, your cheeks might get red. You get tingly, feelings all over. You start sweating. There's an increased thirst. You might start, your body, parts of your body might start swelling. Um, there might be a rapid gain weight if you continuously do this. Nausea, severe vomiting. You might experience issues of neck pain, throbbing headache, blurred vision. Um, you might even experience chest pain or shortness of, of breath, um, a fast with pounding heartbeat, or you might feel like almost like a fluttering in your chest. You might be confused, weak, experience a spinning sensation. You might feel unsteady. You might feel lightheaded, like you're going to pass out, those kinds of things. So what does this sound like? It basically, to me, sounds like an instant hangover, and that's basically what, an what antabuse will do. Um, antabuse, if you drink alcohol after you take the medication, will create an instantaneous hangover because you're trying to deter the user from using more alcohol. So if you make it as bad as humanly possible, then they're not going to want to drink more alcohol. Okay, so just like anything else that we do with our bodies, there's a certain amount of genetics at play. Think about things like eating. Some people could eat meat and meat and never gain any weight. Others can look at a loaf of bread and gain a pound or two instantaneously, it seems. There are differences in our gene that affect our weight, our predisposition to certain cancers and other illnesses. Alcoholism is absolutely, positively no different. If you have a parent who is an alcoholic, the likelihood of you developing alcoholism is higher than someone who was not born to an alcoholic. It does not automatically mean you will become one, but you have a better shot of becoming one when using alcohol compared to someone who did not have alcoholic parents. There are both genetic and environmental concerns at play here. Genetics are influential in things like excessive consumption. So some individuals can consume more alcohol than others without getting sick. 
Some can consume alcohol more than others without becoming dependent, or dependence may become delayed. There also might be a diminished feedback effect. So my body does not necessarily register that I'm as drunk as I really am, or my body does not register that I'm consuming a dangerous amount of alcohol. There might be an enhanced sense of pleasure and a diminished sense of hangover. So for some, the hangovers aren't as bad as they would be for others. However, as we know, the environment in which we drink in and the environment in which we are raised in also have a large impact um, on our alcohol consumption and how we feel compared to others. So the long-term effects of alcohol on our organ systems and our bodily functions. Our brains and our nervous systems are one of the first things that are impact and impacted and everything is depressed as we've been saying. So if you look at the picture on your screen, the brain on the left is that of an alcoholic and the brain on the right is that of a non-alcoholic. So whenever your central nervous system is depressed, your brain lights up more um, showing the areas in which uh, decreased or depressed brain activity is occurring. So the areas on the right in green are the healthy active levels of brain activity that are not impacted or impaired by alcohol use. Your liver is also largely impacted because your liver is the thing that is going to metabolize alcohol through your entire body. So a few different things are of note that we need to be concerned about. The more we drink, a hepatoxic effect might occur in which an enlarged and fatty liver might develop after drinking multiple drinks per day over a period of several days. This is reversible once the consumption ends. You also might experience alcoholic hepatitis. This occurs when fat cells, fat cells keep growing because the consumption does not end. Chronic inflammation of the liver occurs but is still reversible if the drinker stops drinking. Jaundice, rashes, and other symptoms might be associated with alcoholic hepatitis. Cirrhosis is the worst case scenario. Cirrhosis is non-reversible. Your liver basically starts to grow scar tissue, and once you have more scar tissue than active healthy liver, your liver stops being able to metabolize things. This can be fatal, and you might be in need of a liver transplant with a piece of healthy liver. There's basically no cure for cirrhosis. These pictures here show a healthy liver and an unhealthy liver. The liver on the top is completely healthy. It's good to go. It can process and metabolize alcohol the way that it's supposed to. And in the bottom picture, you can see that there's some bigger holes, um, and it's sort of turning a darker brown color. There's some spotting on it. Basically, here we're moving towards alcohol, oh, excuse me, alcoholic hepatitis. And then here you can see a picture with a liver with cirrhosis. So all the sort of black, gray little nodes and nodules that are on the liver, that's scar tissue. So eventually this could get so bad that the majority of the liver turns this black, gray color with all of these nodules. And when that occurs, then your liver cannot process anything else and it stops metabolizing. And that's when you need the liver transplant. Okay, a few other things. Our blood is affected, our cardiovascular systems, and our sexual organs as well. So in terms of blood problems, um, basically the more alcohol you drink, you decrease the production of red blood cells in your body, white blood cells, and your platelets. This can basically develop problems with clotting, and you, if you decrease your white blood cell count, you are risking your immunity to infection. Thinner blood will occur, um, so if you cut yourself, you'll bleed for longer. If you're having blood thinning issues, you could potentially go on Coumadin for, or another blood clotting medication. Um, however, most of these medications require you to stop drinking completely. You can also experience anemia, meaning there's not enough iron in your blood. In terms of your cardiovascular system, there is the dilation of blood vessels. Um, sometimes you might see somebody who's running around and they have a red nose or they have broken blood vessels in their face. That is caused by prolonged alcohol use. You can also experience alcoholic cardiomyopathy in which congestive heart failure um, occurs due to the replacement of heart muscle walls with fat and fiber. The more you drink, the more fatty tissue overtakes your heart muscle and it basically starts to enlarge your heart. 
Your heart cannot function in the same way that it is used to, so it is struggling to pump blood normally. This can result in an irregular heartbeat or arrhythmia, or can even result in a massive coronary heart attack. In terms of your sexual organs, this is obviously the irony for many alcoholic endeavors. Most people who drink for a period of time normally want to have sex at the end of the night, um, but the more you drink, especially men, the less likely it is that you will be able to have sex. Um, it decreases your ability to maintain an erection, it lowers your sperm count, and it diminishes the hormones that are found in your blood. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you, these are the cheeks of a chronic drinker. This is the thing that I was talking about before in terms of um, the dilation of blood vessels. So if you see somebody who has these on their cheeks, basically this is one of the more pronounced signs, outward signs of chronic drinking. So an individual's capillaries in his face have basically exploded and it leaves these little lines behind. This normally happens after years and years of drinking behaviors, though, so not to fret if you're going out this Friday. Okay, so this time we spent a little bit of time talking about the pharmacological effects of alcohol that occur in our systems. What we did not talk about was any of the behavioral effects of alcoholism or uh, drinking alcohol. So in the next lecture, that's what we're going to focus on. What behavior, what behaviors are a result of increased alcohol use in a social, cultural, and legal normative setting. So meet me back here next time when we focus on chapter eight of your textbook and we'll talk about alcohol from a more behavioral approach. So meet me back here next time. I thank you guys for your time and attention today and I'll see you later. Bye.